All right. So welcome to Beyond the Physical. I am so thankful that you are here with us for another interview. Today we have Peter Russell. I am I'm so excited to bring you and introduce you to this man who's also been new to my world and has already sprinkled so much goodness into it. So Peter is known for The Global Brain. This is a book that he published in the 80s, coined the term, and this was a concept of the internet. I'm sure he'll explain a little bit more about that, but before the internet was a thing. So he also is an author of 10 other books. He's a native to England and found his way to the United States through different speaking engagements and book tours and has landed in a place, beautiful Northern California landscape. Uh, Peter, I'm so thankful and honored for you to be here. Is there anything else that you would like to share for us or share with us as an introduction? Oh, I could share lots. <laughs> I think it'll probably all come out. Not, nothing specific. That, that's lovely. I like introductions to be brief and it will all unfold. Yes. Beautiful. Well, I have so many questions for you about the global brain. You've mentioned a couple of times that, that this was something that came to you, but also really kind of put you on the public map. Yeah. So can you share with us about how the global brain came to you? Yes, there were several things that came together. Um, one, I, I'd finished, um, I did a postgraduate degree in computer science, and I was involved in some of the very, very early networking computers with huge thick cables like this thick coming through the ceiling. And, and I just saw the future of computing was not just bigger and faster computers, but also computers linking together in networks. And I was, mm -hmm. I saw that in the very early stages. And at the same time, um, I the Gaia hypothesis had just been published by Jim Lovelock, and he was showing you how different systems on Earth perform different functions as if the whole Earth was a single living system. And I thought, well, what's humanity doing here? Because we've been around, you know, for a very short time in terms of Earth's history. And it struck me that what we're good at is information processing, human beings with their brains, their language. So we're the information processors on the planet and like seeing, OK, and now we're beginning to link together. And I started seeing parallels between the way the brain links together in the womb and the way humanity was linking. I could see well, where this was going would be the linking of humanity into a global brain. So that was that was fascinating. Um, back then, none of us saw where it was really going. We were, we were thinking in terms of data and stuff. None of us were thinking of online shopping and movies and all social media and the stuff we take for granted. So, you know, over the, what, 50 years since then, 40 years since then, it's been major, um, fascinating watching it all actually unfold to where we are today. Yeah. I, I've, absolutely. I've, I've thought of the internet as like the physical manifestation of the collective unconscious. Whereas Carl Jung has talked about that for, for so many years and, you know, mandalas and certain symbols. And we see this in ancient cultures that can be seen as, as a collective and unconscious. We just have such, we have a hailstorm going on right now and it is slightly right. distracting. <laughs> um, but it's like that collective unconscious that mirrors through time and also mirrors through cultures globally before any type of internet or any type of known connection. Um, and so I'm also curious because you did say that you were working, you know, in computer science and data and that sort of thing. Was there an awareness for you when you were writing this book that that was part of your soul calling and that it would end up basically snowballing into what your life's work has also been? Definitely, definitely. I mean, a bit more background. I'd, I'd also been to India and been studying meditation and was fascinated by consciousness and the coming together, we say, you know, collective consciousness and seeing the awakening of the consciousness was the next step for humanity and the most important step, because if you look at all that's going wrong, the problems we face, we're doing all we can to solve the problems, but we're not dealing with the root cause, which is our sort of materialistic self-centered consciousness. And that was really my mission in life and has been all along to, you know, do what I can to distill spiritual teachings and present them in everyday language. And I could see that the internet, as well as, you know, doing what it was going to do, all the unforeseen stuff, it was also about raising consciousness and it would become a medium through which we would actually awaken our consciousness. 
And so, you know, a question I posed was, were we going to awaken into a sane global brain or an insane global brain? And that depended on the actual spiritual awakening. And that, that's been the main thread of my life. So the book was really serving that purpose to awaken mm -hmm. people to the value of the, you know, the, the inner inquiry as opposed to the outer inquiry. Right, right. So when you are like, when you're connecting into that now, and let's say, I'm sure you had some predictions in the eighties when you were writing this book and just premonitions and foresight, how would you see that that relates to where you're at now and where the world is now? Like, has have there been timelines and things that you've seen come to fruition? And what has clicked in and what has just been like mind blowing? Like, I didn't see that one coming. Right. In terms of mind blowing, didn't see that one coming. Almost everything. <laughs> just you know, <laughs> you know, we're also stuck in how we saw computers and the Internet back then. You know, the idea of images and sharing movies on the internet just didn't wasn't in people's minds. So all of where the internet's gone has been mind blowing. The one thing that I, I talked about a lot in the global brain, how um, the rate of change was accelerating, and this would ex this would continue to accelerate the rate of change. And we've seen that. I mean, things are so much faster now than they were 40, 50 years ago, and they're going to keep on getting faster and faster. And now we're seeing that we, you know, everybody's talking about AI and chat GPT and where artificial intelligence is taking us. So the one thing I've seen steadily throughout all of this is the rate of change is speeding up. And in the future, it's just going to get faster and faster and faster. And there's no, no stopping that. It's, just, it's almost a natural thing. Whenever you have positive feedback in the system, change occurs faster and faster. So that's the one thing I predicted above all the you know, specific changes, which were unpredictable, the actual forms, that what has stayed steady is the ever increasing pace of change. And we see that who knows where we're gonna be in two or three years time before we could say, who knows where we'll be in 10 years time. Now we don't know where we'll be in two or three years time things are changing so fast. I can absolutely agree with that tenfold. Um, and since we've talked about your experience with transcendental meditation and just in the, our first conversation and even setting up for this call, I can feel it so strong in your field. So before we get into that, because I do want to explore that, one more kind of bridge question that I want to ask is, like, we just talked about technology and where technology is speeding up and who knows where that's going to take us. Can you explain your perspective on how you see human evolution either keeping up with the rise of the tides or what's also happening with like the mental distress that we're seeing happening more and more frequently? Like how would you address the ascension of technology and how humans are keeping up with it or not keeping up? What is the effect uh, or what effects can you see that right. are affecting positively and negatively? Yeah. Yes. I mean, the negative effects are that we, you know, have more and more things to do, more things to keep up with in terms of our lives and social media or whatever, and new software to learn. Just the rate of change that produces that creates stress for us. We have less time, seemingly, to do things. In you know, computers are always said to be going to be this big labor labor saving device. They turned out to just give us more and more things to do and more and more work to do. We didn't have emails back then. No, we, we didn't have messages or anything. So that's that's been, I think, you know, the negative side. I think the positive side has been that it has made spiritual teachings so much more available. When I started out in this years ago, there were just a few, a few books that and that was it. And now we've got books, videos, you know, we're talking about it on the internet. And what this is doing, I think, is opening opening people's awareness on a very broad level to the possibility that there are other ways of being that we other ways of seeing the world that we can actually step out of our rather limited consciousness and i think that's really important for dealing with where we are in the world today because as things speed up and we get busier we need to be able to step back and actually check in and be you know step back to that cool calm collective place that i call home the, the actual our spiritual mental home is coming back there and we didn't have the ability to do that before so that's really coming along now more and more people just really getting interested in how we can basically quieten the mind and come back to that state of stillness 
which the mystics have always spoken about. And that to me is you know essential for all times, but just getting more and more and more important for us today. Yeah, I you know, you said something in there that I, I think really encompasses all of like what the concept of beyond the physical is, the whole idea. Um, and for me, it came through my experiences by what I would say as fate pulling me into the world of crypto. I was not seeking it. I had no desire to go there. It was just clear premonitions, clear guidance, and then an opportunity that showed up and was like, well, this is it. Um, and, and now that I'm unfolding and looking hindsight and realizing why, why all that was there is that I see a very specific pathway opening and like a very specific purpose for me in braiding the two industries around the leading edge of consciousness and the leading edge of the digital revolution and being able to make meditations. Like I heard your name, I connected with you. I was able to go to your website, do one of your meditations, and that would not be possible without the digital revolution that we are in. And so I also see it as a quickening for ascended teachers who are here incarnate from the angelic realm, from other interplanetary dimensions that come to earth to be teachers and to be way showers, to also ascend in a much greater capacity than we'd be able to without. And that's talking about the leader. But when it comes also to the people that are receiving the teachings, it's so much more easily accessible that we can do these meditations while laying in bed rather than going on a pilgrimage, you know, through Spain or, or all of these things. And one of the things, because I, I spent the pandemic in Bali, I helped a friend deliver a baby through a home birth. It was a whole experience for me. It was as natural and earthy and human as it gets. And then, you know, within a matter of a year was in Dubai, which is like the epicenter of facade and what is real and what isn't. And one of the things that I felt a lot of my Bali community was afraid of the metaverse was like how much dark energy there is, how much, you know, soul sucking stuff there is. And there's so much fear around it. And I definitely had a little bit of that predisposition. But I ended up doing a reading with a man who was a co-founder for a metaverse project. And when I did this reading with him, I heard the voice of Mama Gaia. I heard the voice of the earth breathing a sigh of relief on her resources that instead of us global leaders needing to get in a plane and use all these resources and transportation and plastic food, all these things, that we were able to have a virtual meeting space that actually took a breath and a relief off of her resources to continue the evolution of humanity. And when I saw that, it really just clicked in with me. And there were many other kind of, you know, focal points that encouraged me to step onto this path. But that was one that really, really anchored as truth within me and also wanting to be a voice for Mama Gaia and seeing how the pandemic environmentally you know we're seeing dolphins going through the canals of italy and all these things um so is there anything that has kind of sparked for you as i'm sharing that because i'd love to hear your perspective on where we're at now as well ah oh. i mean i i hear all, all that you're saying I'm, I'm just as equally fascinated by it but in terms of I and mean, what you're saying about you know teachers today which i find fascinating in the past you know, we didn't have many teachers. You, we hear about them now. There might have been somebody in India or somebody somewhere else. You know, the only teachers we had in the past were possibly, you know, a local priest. That was it. Or, or some wise woman or something in the local community. And who knows how wise they really were. And that what we have today is because of the, the teachings being so much more widely available. And when you get positive feedback, we're all learning from each other the whole time. And so we have millions and millions of us on the path. And as we all learn, you know, and we share with others, I share through writing and talking, you share, and you know, I learn from you, you learn from me, we all learn from each other. And so we have this acceleration in the awakening. And so what we have now is, as you mentioned, we have numerous, you know, people who've awoken 
here and now in this life and teaching. And that has never, ever been possible before. You don't have to travel anywhere now to go and find an enlightened, awakened person. And even then, you were very, very lucky if you did. Now you just turn on your computer and there's hundreds of places you can go to. And this, I find, is unique, unique in terms of human history and what makes it so exciting, because it isn't just that the teachings are available, but there's wise people we can go to and really not just hear about the teachings, but hear from them. And that, to me, is the important thing, that real wisdom it comes out of people's mouths, not just what they write down and when we interact with them. And this, this to me, makes it unique. And that is totally because of the digital revolution that this is possible. I would even say this conversation as an example of that. Absolutely. Uh, you know, of me hearing your name, receiving the referral, and then reaching out and being able to just have a conversation within a matter of 24 to 48 hours. To me, this journey of curating the summit has been so inspiring and so exciting because I, I love having these conversations. And I think there's something that's so isolating about being a light worker and also going through the process of awakening. You know, I've talked, I can't even tell you countless people who start to feel that isolation of, I don't feel like I can relate to my friends and family anymore. I don't wanna be drinking. I wanna be getting out of these cycles or these patterns. I don't really know how it feels isolating. I don't know who I can talk to. And being in this capacity and being online and being able to see that there are way showers that are out there using their voice and then being able to pick up Instagram and literally just send a direct message. It's, it blows my mind how many incredible human beings we can actually start conversations with every single day like that. I mean, I'm like beaming just thinking about it because the possibilities just start opening up in, in the most incredible ways. Yeah, yeah. We live in we live in unique times. And, you know, we don't see where it's going. Just as, you know, back then we had no idea where the Internet or the World Wide Web, which didn't even exist, where that was going to take us. We don't have any idea where we're going to be in even five years time, particularly with AI. I mean, we're going to see things which are going to be like almost magic to us today. And. And again, you know, some of it's going to be in the service of, you know, business and the economy and politics and all that. But it's also at the same time, a lot's going to be in service of the awakening of consciousness. So what I'm fascinated by is how, how this acceleration is not just in the rate of change of things, but it's an acceleration in the waking of human consciousness. And I'd say, who knows where we'll be in that respect in five years time? Could mm -hmm. be, yeah, magic, I think, compared to how we are now. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And that's in my life experience. That's where I really started to see that interweaving between the two. It's like the leading edge of the digital revolution and tech, whether the people are creating it are fully conscious and aware of their sole purpose and drive and divinity. The answer for me on that is no <laughs> in meeting a lot of the developers, but also knowing that the leading edge of consciousness, because we're all interacting with the collective field together, it's that they're going hand in hand with one another. And right. so it's not for us to be afraid of one direction or the other, because so it's like so much goodness can birth through this. Right. And obviously we live in a dualistic world where light and dark exist in a balance. And yeah. so, yes, there will be dark experiences cultivated and created. And if we are vibrating at that frequency, that's what we'll experience. And simultaneously, as the light continues to birth more and more and more into form, we will also have access and resources to be able to experience those in the human body. Right. I mean, we, we are in a time of, of reckoning where end of the world prophecies are happening left and right. The white buffalo through uh, the, the story of white buffalo calf woman is now here. We've got the floods, the fires, all the shenanigans. <laughs> and we also have the digital revolution, which none of these prophecies even touched on or talked about. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, it is just wild right now and so exciting. Right. And one thing, just to go back on something you touched upon in terms of, you know, spirituality in the tech world. One thing I would say in their favor, when I when I started back in this in the in the 80s, I was teaching meditation in corporations and mm -hmm. they made me keep it secret. I was teaching you know, one public corporation name. I was teaching their boardroom 
you know, at some big tower block in London, and they made me promise never to tell anybody because they didn't want the media to know about it. Now you have people like Google, you know, with their programs, encouraging everybody to meditate, taking meditation out to other people, you know. So the leading edge of the corporate world you know, is actually promoting meditation now rather than try to hide it. You know, we think it's good, but we don't want anybody to know. Now they're saying, hey, you know, do this. It's wonderful. So there's been that shift in the tech world. Absolutely. Absolutely. And a- another reading that I did with hopefully um, somebody who, well, not hopefully, who's going to be a guest here, um, was I was able to see his sole purpose and his sole path was to create this technology and was to bring this here to the planet in the way that he is. And it's a token economy ecosystem that would help you create your own token, me create my own token, and then also the technology that um that makes liquidity very easy, meaning you can come into my world and you, and use your tokens and it would transfer to mine and, and that sort of thing. So it's very complex technology. It's very leading edge. It's something that governments are trying to like kibosh left, right and center. And simultaneously, when people have asked me, you know, if I think crypto is going to make it, you know, through the shenanigans that it's gone through. For me, it's like there are way too many brilliant minds who are soul aligned and are soul destined to bring this technology here. And that's where I mean that and in what I saw in Dubai was also just very high level criminal masterminds of people taking advantage of this circumstance. And so in the same way that we have that in law, in politics, in the healthcare system, it really comes down to discernment and discernment of how are we showing up for ourselves and who are we choosing to align and associate with that really determines our quality of life like (laughs) across the board um but it you know it's all there we don't want to pretend that it's not it's definitely all there yeah yeah. (laughs) yes yeah um so with that i i want to go back to what we talked about a bit with the transcendental um Um, Yes, to the transcendental connection. This was something in in our intro conversation. I I just want to speak to this because as we were talking, you know, getting to know each other, do we want to do this? Does it feel aligned? I felt just such a strong wave of gentle, peaceful ease wash through me. And I knew immediately that the presence of what it is that you have embodied and that you have been able to fully carry through your life experience is such a gift to share. So it, it's my honor and pleasure to just open that opportunity for whatever it is that feels natural for you to share with us in, in this space, in this time, um, yeah, to please please do and feel free to express however that feels natural to you. Wonderful, thank you. Well, I think just to say very briefly, I mean, my own history of meditation, where I am as a context, I started off with transcendental meditation, which um, was the, the one the Beatles started by the Maharishi, and that's how I first got interested. And one of the things that struck me, he said how meditation should be effortless and should be enjoyable. And what I've seen over the many years is often it's the exact opposite people are trying to concentrate they can't do it and people say oh, I tried to meditate I couldn't stop thoughts coming in you know I don't enjoy it and so what I've been doing is actually developing practices that actually involve no effort whatsoever because it, it to me is just relaxing allowing the mind to relax and when you do that it is enjoyable because the you know, if I, if we're not enjoying life it's because our thoughts and things are going through us, we're telling ourselves all these stories, we're getting upset, we're making ourselves discontent. In meditation, to me, we're letting go of all those stories, and so we just sink back into this much more peaceful, enjoyable state without any effort. And I think it's part of our culture is we're trained. You know, if you're not succeeding, try harder, which may be okay in some areas of life, not all. But in meditation, it's definitely not the case. So it's about almost undoing that conditioning to, to do that. And so what I'd like to do, and thank you for the opportunity, is just to lead very short, maybe just, you know, five minutes, maybe a bit more, just meditation. How, how, I, how I present meditation, just a very simple version of it, just to give people 
a simple taste of it and to see how easy it is and how quickly the mind can settle down if we just allow it to. And so for this, I just suggest, well, first of all, just make sure you're sitting comfortably. So I don't have any particular sitting position. I mean, I don't care how you sit as long as you're comfortable. That's the main thing. And then I just ask people just to just close your eyes, nothing more. And maybe take a few deeper breaths because when we breathe out, it's like a sign to the body that everything is okay. And right now in this moment, there's nothing we need to worry about, nothing we need to do. So we can just begin to sit here and just relax. I say just a few deeper breaths, just allows the body just to settle into being here. And then just noticing any sounds there may be around you. There's my voice, sounds in your room or outside. But in this, we're not focusing on anything. We're just, just being present and just noticing what is. And noticing what's going on in your body. Because there's probably lots of sensations there that we don't normally notice. I mean, sensations in your feet, whatever they're touching. Just, just noticing them. Maybe sensations as you connected with the seat, the back of the chair, if you're against one, just noticing the sensations. Maybe in your hands, whatever they're touching. And in this, we're not trying to focus on anything. We're just, we're just opening our awareness to the present. We often think of, you know, we're zo normally zoomed in on something. I think of this as zooming out, just letting our awareness zoom out and just say, oh, here I am. This is where I'm here. This is the world I'm in. Here's my body. You may notice sensations in the face. You may notice just the gentle rising and falling of the chest as you breathe. I say we're just allowing our consciousness to soften and relax. That's all. We're not trying to get to any particular place. There's in fact nothing we need to do. I say we're just allowing, allowing the mind to relax. And from time to time, we will all notice. Thoughts come in, we get carried away by some thought about something or other, which seems important at the time. And then we notice it's no longer gripping the mind. We notice we've been thinking. In that moment, we've already become present. We're present again to the fact we've been thinking. And we just choose not to follow that thought anymore for now. We can do that later. For now, we just choose not to follow that thought. And when we do that, the present begins to reveal itself again. The thought was taking us out into something about the past or the future. We just choose not to follow it and just, ah, here I am, sitting here, those same sounds or different ones. Here's my body, feelings in the body. And again, just letting, letting our attention soften and relax, not focusing on anything. I'm beginning to notice how it is as we do this, how it feels. And by this, I mean, it probably feels hopefully just a little more relaxing, a little easier, maybe a little quieter. You may notice just a hint of some greater inner stillness. And when you do notice you've got caught in a thought and you just choose not to follow it anymore, just notice the difference when we've been thinking and then when we just pause thinking, it's like, ah, oh, yes, this feels, this feels nice. So we're just really beginning to savor this quality of allowing ourselves to relax, allowing the mind to relax. And wherever your attention may be in this moment, just see, could the attention itself be softer, more relaxed? 
And as we do, we just normally notice ourselves just coming a little bit closer, a little bit closer to that place I call home inside us. That place where it's like, ah, oh, yes, in this moment, everything's okay in this moment. I can just be here, allowing myself to relax. In this moment, there's nothing to worry about. And just, I say, noticing how that feels. And what I like to do is just as a way of noticing how it is, almost savoring how it is, just to allow an inner smile to be there. Just like allow your being, allow your being to smile inwardly in a, in a way of just saying, ah, oh, yes, yes, this is nicer. I prefer this than that busy world of the mind. Just allowing that inner smile to be there. Both allows us to savor it and also just encourages that letting go. As one Chinese Zen master said, nowhere to go, nothing to do, and no one to be. We can just allow ourselves to just taste that in this moment. Let's just take another half minute or so just to continue just sitting here. And again, if you wander off, just gently not following the thought and just allowing yourself to come back and settle into the ease of just being here in this moment. And then we can just slowly let our attention come back here to being in this group, being on this call. But don't rush back. Maybe you just like to flex your fingers and toes to sort of bring a little activity back. And don't rush to open the eyes. When you feel ready to open the eyes, just do so. You know, maybe let a little light in at first so that we just gradually come back to this more active world. And that way we can sort of bring more of this quietness, whatever we felt, we can just bring that back into the world with us, which is really one of the values of meditation. And I know that was very short and I don't expect you to reach some great deep profound state but just really as a taste of just how it can be easy effortless and enjoyable just to begin to just to let go so just 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 a taste of what i think is possible in meditation when you just when you let go of any trying to get anywhere and just just relax that's all Feels so calm and so peaceful now. <laughs> and I actually, I haven't felt called on any of these conversations before, but I'm feeling called to share a bit of a light prayer. Is that okay with you? Yeah. Beautiful. All right. So feeling into that peacefulness that we are in here. <laughs> 
Ai ai a unu ai a i o kua haa tarai, i o a anai i kia haa kua sutrunua, i o a punu ai a turunua ai a ki o ua haa karai. And there's just a prayer of encouragement, of feeling safe in our own hearts. So where there may be fear or hesitation to lean fully into the center of our own hearts and the center of that own heart consciousness, there's just a very gentle prayer and encouragement to open our hearts a little bit more and to lean in to that internal divinity that exists at the core of our own soul. And so I, I thank you so much, Peter, for sharing such just peaceful, calm, gentle, masculine energy. It's something that I don't want to say it's rare in this world, but I think it's something that very few of us get to experience on a day to day basis. Um, and so thank you for anchoring that. I have felt it. It has helped nurture my heart in more ways than I can put into words here. Um, and thank you for sharing your perspective with the global brain. Is there anything that you would like to add as the closing thought before we close out this beautiful conversation? Yes, just a little really practical thing. You know, we're talking about how we integrate this into our life. You know, we may not have time to meditate a lot of the times, but what I find really valuable is what, what I did then was just a few minutes. You can just, any time in the day, you can just pause what you're doing, but pause your thinking. Just like stop and just notice where your thinking is. It's probably, oh, I've got to do this next or that. The, the mind is always going on planning, doing stuff, analyzing, whatever it is, the mind's busy. Just that thing of just pausing the thought for just five seconds, 10 seconds, and in that, just like, ah, oh, yes, here I am. And then it's going to come back. You'll be off back into the world. But we can do that a hundred times a day, just pausing, stopping. And you get, oh, there's birdsong out there, or there's thunder, or there's whatever. You just, you just notice the present moment again. And we can, that to me is the important thing. You're just pausing, noticing the present moment, taking a few seconds just to savor it before we get caught in the next thing. I, I love that reminder, even, you know, just the stillness and presence while we take a sip of our coffee or when we wash our hands or when we put on our shoes. Nice. Um, when I, <laughs> this is a little bit of an add on here, but when I was launching my first big mastermind, I was about to start asking for a $25,000 ticket, which was about twenty. $3,000 more than what I was used to asking. And so to, to prime my mind for it, I would say over and over, you know, $30,000 as I was pulling up my socks. And I just remembered, you know, to, to leave room for that. But it, it's, it's those moments when we feel that we are doing the most mundane things where we let our mind wander and we're, you know, it's just kind of like off in the ethers. But to what you're saying in that reminder, it's like if we can focus in on what we're doing in every moment and get better and better, better at, I don't want to say maximizing like it's a challenge or something, but maximizing the present moment in the sense that we fully experience the present moment. That's when I really find that life just delivers opportunity and the synchronicities come through. So, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for the reminder. Um, and I would love to encourage everybody that's here listening, go ahead and connect with Peter. We have his website below. We've got a freebie below that you can connect with and just explore a little bit more of staying connected to see again how this all unfolds but peter i want to say thank you so much for your willingness for your time for this connection i'm so honored to know you and i'm excited to see how it will all continue to unfold so thank you for being a new friend in my world <laughs> thank you lovely really lovely to meet you really nice. all right and for those that are listening ciao ciao for now and i'll see you in the next interview